And now, with sound investing, here's Paul Merriman. When we started our foundation, we created a mission. And that mission was to provide information and tools to help investors of all ages. And we really meant of all ages. It's pretty easy to think about how you could give advice that could last from the time that somebody goes to work and puts money aside and then retires and eventually passes that savings and, and, and portfolio along to others. But our goal was to go further, and that was to offer advice on what to do for even a newborn child. Now, it's been a while since we've had a newborn child uh, in our family. Uh, my, uh, I have a nine-year-old grandson, but in the last uh, month or so, uh, we have a new granddaughter. And this, uh, this made me rethink and, and really focus on what am I going to do? And I say, what am I going to do? It's what, 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 is my, what am my wife and I going to do uh, to do something good for her as we have done for the other grandchildren? And it made me go back to the drawing board and think of, of the implications of how this money was set aside. Now, I'm going to be talking very openly about what we did. Uh, I'm going to talk about it generically. And then Daryl is going to dive into some numbers. I mean, he is, he is the man of tables here. And he's going, to, he's going to present a whole bunch of tables. But these are tables for people who might want to give less, maybe give more, might want to do it for different reasons, might want to take different levels of risk. There are a whole bunch of variables that Daryl's going to take a look at. But it starts, I think, with somebody being interested in the idea of, of helping other young people. So uh, I've written articles, we've written articles. When I say we, I mean Rich Buck and I have, have, have written articles about how to put away $365 a year, how to put away $3,000 one time, and, and, and how to invest that for a newborn child. Um, uh, and this time, Instead of putting the money into a crummy trust, which we've talked about at length some years ago, and just so you know, a crummy trust makes it possible to put away some money for an, anybody, but it could be a newborn child. And there is a way that you very easily uh, can take, give that money to them, take it back, put it into a trust that they can't touch for however long you want it to be. And I have grandchildren who can't touch it until they're 65. Uh, and that money is compounding tax deferred uh, until they are uh, 65, and then they get to start taking some money out. But this is a very different approach. But the idea was, how could we put some money aside that could compound tax-free or tax-deferred for the rest of their life? And how could we do it in a way that if we gave it to them, it would likely remain trying to achieve the original goal that grandma and grandpa had for this grandchild? Uh, and so this, what we're going to discuss today, is what I consider to be our, our best shot at having that happen. If I could, the $10,000 that we have gifted to each one of the grandchildren, all we really wanted to do was to put it aside and let it compound tax-free if possible. The problem is that to do a tax-free compounding means a Roth IRA. And we don't have a way to put this granddaughter to work 
and, uh, and, and, and pay her for her work and get that money set aside. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to put that money into an account. And Daryl will talk about how that is going to work. And then to move money out of that account into the child's Roth IRA when they have the earned income, in essence, as quickly as possible to get everything underneath the umbrella of that tax-free environment. Now, I've been criticized. Even my wife has criticized me about this idea of tying up the money until the child is retired. But I look at it different. You know, people save money for the down payment on a house. They, 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 they save money to go for a trip. And the idea is to have enough to do it the way that you would like to do it. And what I do wish for each of our grandchildren is that when they retire, hopefully having done something remarkable or fun or productive uh, during their working years, that they will then spend probably a third of their life retired. And by the way, those that don't have enough are really likely to work until they're 70 before they retire. Maybe with this $10,000, it could produce enough return over 50 or 55 or 60 years that they don't have to work until they're 70. Or as in my case, if they're loving what they're doing and they're willing to work until they're 70, I think it would be nice if they found that in retirement they had enough income to do everything they might like to do. And they're really, as, as I think you all know, if you had a wish list and uh, you could just magically have the money in your retirement account to pay for the wish list, there probably are places that many people would like to travel or experiences they'd like to have, or money they'd like to give away to causes they care about, but that they have not unlimited amounts of money, but more money. And by the way, it may be simply to live a, a better lifestyle in terms of, doesn't have to be something where you travel the world. I know lots of people, I'm kind of one of them, that if I didn't travel a lot, it would be quite all right. But 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 a lot of people do want to travel. A lot of people just want to have the security of having enough during a period of time. They no longer have income, and they they like to have the idea that they they have enough. And of course, I would I've always thought to have more than enough would be nice, just in case something went wrong. And for some people. I think the money might not have much impact on them, but they might like the idea of giving money away. I must say that it is a luxury to be able to donate amounts of money to other people for projects that, that my wife and I think are honorable, good things, and to be able to support those charitable uh, organizations. That can be very special. And in fact, the older I get, the more fun giving is. And I think most people have that experience as, I, as they get older. In fact, I have read or been told that the average person really doesn't start giving away much money until they're about 62. So to be able to have extra money to give away, I think that would be a neat thing to, to, to do. And, and my wife thinks that everything I do has to do with my ego. Well, maybe it does. But here is a little, is a little thought I have, uh, and this is my ego showing. I'm thinking that if this $10,000 works out and our grandchildren will have 
more money to use, to enjoy, give to others. I hope the impact is good and doesn't cause a problem. But, you know, by the time you get to retirement, really, that's a that's a I think a whole different ball game when it comes to money. So what I'm what I'm hoping is is that our grandchildren will remember us from time to time. And by the time they're 60 or 65, it wouldn't surprise me if I if if my wife and I were not daily uh, topics of discussion. But if we've helped leave them a pool to enjoy life, you know, I think it would be nice to have them remember that this was a dream we had. And right now, we're working on an article for Market Watch. Rich Buck and I are uh, working on an article that is going to include a letter that will be given to our granddaughter at some age. She might be 18, she might be 21. That's going to depend uh, in large part on her mother when she shares this letter. But that letter, it really isn't about money per se. It's not about investing per se, but it is about the dream that my wife and I have in terms of what this money might do. Now, what we're going to show you are some numbers. I'm going to call them, for the sake of discussion, the nominal numbers. These are the theoretical numbers. But as so often happens, there are the real numbers that it can be very different from the nominal numbers. So I know that inflation will eat up a lot of the value of the growth of this investment. I know tax laws will change. I know it's also possible that our granddaughter will not wait until she's 60 or 65 or whatever that age might be that we had hoped that she would. So the money would grow to be a, of a significant amount and be used in those years of retirement. But we know that might not happen. Those are the real numbers. And, and, and there are 50 things, 50 hurdles. Well, in a sense, there are thousands of hurdles because out there, when this pool of money grows to be significant, there are thousands of people who have got a great idea better than what we're going to suggest that money be invested in. And we'll be talking about that as well today as a part of this uh, presentation on how this process works. So there are a lot of hurdles to be cleared, but I think the process, at least theoretically, is pretty simple. And Daryl has done, I just think, a great job of putting together the numbers. Remember, we always like to follow the math when we can. And I think you'll find this, uh, a, a hopeful trip. So, Daryl, would you be so kind as to lay it out and step by step what you did in terms of the numbers, which, of course, also implies what happens to the, mo the money and how it gets invested. Could you please do that? And then when you're done, well, Chris, you and I can butt in at any time. That's the deal. And, and Daryl, we won't, we won't be rude. But if we have a question, we're probably thinking somebody else has a question, and uh, and and we're not going to wait till the end for all the questions. But we'll try to stay out of your presentation as best we can, Daryl, and just let you have the fun. You've done a great job on this project, and and as always, you guys are are masters at helping people understand uh, investing. So fire away, my friend. So Paul gave a very good introduction about what we're going to talk about this morning. And that's that's how to build a fund for your grandchild that can can provide a lasting legacy for your grandchild. So as Paul mentioned, there are many reasons you can do this and, and they're personal and, and varied for everyone. You, uh, you can provide supplemental income during retirement, achieving life goals for your grandchild, 
provide a buffer against life's unknowns and all of these things, or, and there are many other things too. And all of these things mean you might operate the fund differently than you intended to, to begin with, or that the way we've chosen to, to implement the fund, it can all be different. And so what that means is that maybe the amount you can put in isn't the same. Maybe you don't feel comfortable reaching for the rate of return that we show. Um, maybe you can't, st- maybe your child's already five years old. And so you can, your grandchild, so you can only start now. Um, there could be many different things. And so what, what we've done here is to build a simplified scenario where we can change many of those different variables and see what the effect on the ultimate outcome for the grandchild is. How much do they end up having if they retire? What if they retire early? Um, those, those kinds of things. And so, uh, we, we try to go through and look at what the sensitivities of those different parameters are to give you a feel for how your decisions can change the ultimate outcomes. And we've simplified the, the approach, and it, it's only to provide an indication of, of what those sensitivities are, not to provide guidance or, or tell you what the returns are going to be because nobody knows, uh, those kinds of things. So... The basic scenario, and Paul described this a little bit, but the basic scenario um, that we've again simplified is to start with $10,000 at age zero. Child's born, boom, write a check, $10,000 into a taxable investment account. And for our baseline scenario, all these accounts grow at a constant rate of 12% per year. Uh, the taxable account, obviously, you have to pay taxes on the gains and, and dividends in that account, capital gains and dividends on that account. So those are paid by withdrawals from that account. Uh, and also, you, when you make withdrawals from that account to fund the Roth IRA, you have to pay taxes on that. So those are all included in the simulation. Uh, the baseline, again, is retire at 65, take 5% of the Roth account balance at the beginning of the year, every year for for. Uh, expenses or whatever whatever they want to do with it, basically. And the plan ends at age 95. Um, this, is, this is a simplified approach. There are many ways you can make this more complicated, but this is simple enough to show you the sensitivities for the key decisions that you have to make in trying to implement this account and hopefully make the ones that make your account do what you want it to do. Um, some of the assumptions we've had to make about these uh, this uh, approach is that uh, Roth contributions uh, are made on the first of the year. Uh, dividends are considered 100% taxable. Capital gains are considered 100% tax. Capital gains distributions are considered 100% taxable. Um, the capital gains actually are 100% taxable. And all taxes are paid by withdrawals from the taxable account. The Roth contributions are made on the first of the year and the retirement withdrawals are taken on the first of the year, once a year. Um, And also we've chosen to not take any retirement withdrawals from the taxable account. So if there's one still in existence at their retirement, what that means is all these withdrawals are tax free. So uh, if they wanted to take something from a taxable account, they would obviously have to pay taxes on that. Daryl, can I just butt in here for a second? Um, in the, in in this case I'm working on right now with our granddaughter, that taxable account is opened in the name of our daughter. And, and, and so she will be investing that account. The express purpose of this individual separate account is to fund the Roth IRA for the granddaughter. So, uh, some people might choose to put the money in the name of the grandchild in a custodial account. The only thing I'm concerned about is if they do that when the child reaches 18 or whatever the age of majority might be, they have access to that money. And and I, I'm a little sensitive about that. I, I would rather have an adult in charge of it in those early years. And so in the First 20 years, most all the money is in that taxable account uh, in my daughter's name. And it is only then that some money starts to trickle in relative to the to the body of the money into the Roth IRA and gives it some time for the child to get used to having this uh, this account. And uh, uh, and by the way, I think it's important. 
that child will be able to see how that investment did for her for those first 18 or 21 years. So there'll be some real history of how the money grew. Uh, so it will be a kind of, of a personal experience that is typically hard for someone to get because all they know is what other people got or they read about. But this will, in essence, be hers eventually. Right. Thank you. If we go ahead and look at the at the way the simulation is set up, um, even though it's simplified, there are a lot of different inputs to this. Um, the starting age, the starting amount, the rate of return, when you start to, to make Roth contributions, uh, how much the Roth contribution is. We've chosen to make it, Paul has chosen to make it $8,000 here. Um, and that's to try to reflect the fact that those Roth contributions might eventually get bumped up a little bit by the time you start making the contributions here. Um, do we inflate the Roth contribution? Do we do catch-ups? When do you retire? What's the withdrawal rate, portfolio withdrawal rate? When's the end of the plan? Uh, what kind of inflation rate do we use for converting to real dollars? Capital gains tax rate, dividend rate, ordinary dividend tax rate uh, are, are other inputs. Um, you can see those when you when you uh, look at the slides here. So, but the baseline scenario starts at age zero, ten thousand dollars earns twelve percent. Start making Roth contributions at twenty one. The contributions are eight thousand dollars a year. Uh, grandchild retires at sixty five and takes out five percent of the portfolio balance every year at the beginning of the year, and the plan ends at ninety five. Uh, inflation is three percent. Capital gains tax rate for this was 15%. Uh, dividend rate is 2%, and ordinary dividend tax rate is 24%. That's basically your marginal tax rate. So in this scenario, <laughs> you can look at the summary of the results down here, and, and the balance in the taxable account when the grandchild retires is over a million dollars. The balance, these are nominal dollars, and the balance in the Roth account is almost $11 million. So that means the first retirement distribution is $542 or $43,000. And the last retirement at age 95 or 94 actually is $3.2 million. Those are nominal dollars. And so the, <laughs> you look at the total of the retirement distributions and the ending account balances, you end up with a total total benefit of $147 million. Well, those are nominal dollars and that's over 95 years. So what that really shows you is, is the power of inflation, okay? To uh, what we're gonna look at for purposes of the rest of this discussion here are real dollars. They've all been in, brought back to essentially the age when you start the, start the plan, uh, dollars. So if you start at age zero, then there, these are age zero dollars. And so that $147 million total benefit is, is $10 million total benefit. That's still a lot uh, in today's dollars over nine, 95 years. Uh, first retirement withdrawal was $80,000 in, in uh, today's dollars. That's, that's a good bonus. Uh, so By the way, I might also add see, there, there Daryl, that, that uh, retirement balance that is taxable is still in the name of the mother, my daughter. Probably not at the end of the plan, Paul. Well, that's right. I mean, and, and so at the point that the, the her mother passes on, that money then can be inherited with a stepped up basis. Right. Uh, I mean, that's a, now who knows what the tax laws will be, um, but at least in, with today's laws, that's the way it would work. Right. Okay. So let's look at some of this, some of this data. So this screen shows the, the actual simulation spreadsheet driver, the driving spreadsheet. We'll just step through this a bit and, and kind of give you, not going to look at all this and go into all this detail, but it's just to provide you a little peek behind the curtain. So when we look at the tables, you can understand how they were arrived at. 
So again, this is our base, basic scenario. You've seen these inputs before, and then these are the same numbers we saw before with the $10.06 million total benefit. Uh, contributions start at $10,000. By the time you make the first Roth contribution, the account is worth $98,000. And that first $8,000 contribution goes into the Roth account. And then at the end of that year, you have to take out about $1,800 to pay taxes on the gains in the account uh, and the withdrawals on the dividends and on the withdrawals in the account. So that means when you get ready to make the next withdrawal for the next year, the account balance is actually bigger than it was when you started before. And then you do, the, it's 99, almost 100,000. So you do the same thing. And you continue doing this until age 65, when you are age 64, when you make the last, last withdrawal and that goes into the Roth account over here. And after you make that last uh, contribution, the account is over $10 million. Uh, and then the rest of this, uh, as Paul mentioned, it sits in the, in, in the taxable account and continues to grow. And then in the Roth account, the at age 65, the grandchild takes out $542,000. And they, these continue to grow. These are nominal dollars. And so at the end of the scenario, at age 95, the Roth account or the taxable account has a value of $31 million. The Roth account has a value of almost $70 million. And the total amount of the real amount or the total without total amount of withdrawals made in retirement was forty six million dollars. Uh, nominal dollars, what that really means in, in real dollars in terms of what she could have bought, he or she could have bought were is about four million dollars in retirement distributions. There's about two million left in the re, in the taxable account and about four million in today's dollars in the retirement account for a total benefit of about ten million dollars. So that's that's the the layout of how this normally works. We can just look at a I'll show you one quick example here. If you only put in five thousand dollars at age zero, what you see happen is that at re, at age twenty one when you start, the account is only worth forty nine million dollars. So you take out eight eight thousand dollars, you put it into the Roth, same thing. But next year, the account is only worth forty five when it gets comes time to make that second withdrawal. And you notice that by the time the grandchild is 28, the taxable account has been depleted. The Roth has, all of the funds have been moved to the Roth and the Roth has an account balance of about $100,000. And it continues to grow uh, out and it ends up at about $40 million at the end of the plan. Um, and the total, total retirement distributions were about 2.3 million instead of the almost 4 million it was before. So. Let's go back now and look at some of these tables. Okay, so this is the summary chart that we we showed initially for the for the ten for, for the twelve percent returns. You can see these are the same inputs that we had that we described before in the in the ten point oh six billion dollars for the total benefit in terms of real dollars. So what we did was we went through and we looked and we saw, what if we changed some of these values and looked at ranges of these values? How does that affect the outcome? So the first one we looked at was, what if we changed the rate of return? Instead of 12%, suppose we only looked at 10%. We only got 10% return every year, year in, year out. So, the total of the retirement distributions for 12% was 3.9, almost 4 million. At 10%, it's only 1 million, a little over 1 million. These are real dollars. So that's the power of the 2%. Two, two that's the, that's the, the uh, difference between getting 10% and 12%. If you only get 8%, then the real amount of the total withdrawal retirement distributions is about $240,000. In that case, the first, first distribution was about $8,000. The second, the last distribution was about $7,500. The total plan benefit varies from 10 million at 12% to almost 400,000 if you, if you only choose to get 8%. So, 
the next table is the uh, amount of the initial amount you put in. If you put in 10,000, the total benefit, I'm only going to speak to total benefit numbers here because there's so many numbers on this table. You'll have to look at them in the in the show notes uh, to and explore them to your heart's content. Yeah. But uh, the effect of the initial contribution of $10,000, the total benefits again, 10.06. But if you only put in 5,000, it's down to 4.6. And if you only can afford to put in 1,000, it's $940,000 for the total benefit. That resulted in a half of, almost half a million, $456,000 of retirement distributions. That's still a lot of money that's for a $1,000 investment. That's a real, real dollar distribution over retirement. And I can just hear people saying, who is going to leave the investment in equities their whole life? And uh, we'll talk about that. Pardon? We'll talk about that. Okay. Okay. In a, in a little bit. Um, All right. And the only thing I can say about that is, you know, you can change this. This was meant to be simplified. So um, we can talk about rates of return in a little bit. Again, if, if they choose to take out 5%, uh, it's a almost $4 million total distribution. If they take out 8%, remember they're making 12% every year. So if they take out 8%, they still end up with $3.8 million left over. If they take out only 3%, they end up with, uh, not left over, total distributions, 3.8 million. If they take out 3%, they end up with 3.4 million total distributions. So the total distributions is fairly insensitive relatively speaking, to the amount that they take out. Part of that is because the less you take out, the bigger the account is. So the smaller percentage is still a bigger number. So, uh, but the total benefit is what changes. If you take out 8%, you only in, your total benefit is only $7.3 million, only $7.3 million. Um, and if you take out 3%, your total benefit is $13 million. But where most of that is, all of that is, is, is in the Roth balance. It, it's either 7.8 million if you take out 3% or 1.6 million if you take out 8%. So it depends on how much is left um, or how much you take out is, it ends up how much is left in the, in the Roth account. The taxable account balance of about 1.9 million at the end of the plan stays the same because you're not taking you're not touching anything in that account. So then we looked at, at starting ages. How, how sensitive are those things? Um, if you start at zero, again, the total benefit uh, is $10 million. If you start at five, it's six million dollars. This is everything else being equal, equal now. Uh, if you start at 10 years old, it's $4 million. Uh, and uh, if, if you start at 10, the total retirement distributions are about half of what they were if you started at zero. Retirement distributions run from $40,000 at uh, retirement to $100,000. Those are real dollars. If you start at age 10, and that compares to $80,000 and $203,000 for the last distribution if you start at age zero. Uh, the effect of the Roth start age, starting age is is kind of interesting. Um, if you if you start making Roth contributions at eighteen, uh, if the child earns money and, and can afford to to uh, support a contribution to Roth at age eighteen, uh, their retirement distributions goes up quite significantly. And of course, the Roth account is empty, or I mean, the taxable account is empty. There's nothing left there uh, because all the money has been moved to the Roth account. Uh, if you wait until age 25 to start Roth contributions, the total retirement distributions are about two and a half million dollars. And part of the reason for that is because you don't have enough time and why it, is, why it is so much less is because you don't have enough time to empty the Roth taxable account um, before they start taking money, before they retire. And so you end up with a large retirement, a large taxable account balance 
and the Roth account is there are fewer years. So the Roth account balance at the end of the plan is, is much smaller uh, than if you had started Roth contributions at age 21 or earlier. Uh, total benefit is, is fairly insensitive to the Roth starting age. It, it varies from about 9.3 million at age 18 to about 13 million um, over at, at age 25, if you start then, uh, still a lot of money. Uh, if they retire earlier or later, uh, if they let me see, if they retire earlier at age sixty, uh, remember the basic benefit, basic total benefit was ten thousand, ten million dollars. They're down to about eight point six million dollars if they retired at sixty, and about seven point four million if they retired at fifty-five. So that's again all things considered, relatively insensitive and a relatively large amount of real money. Yeah, and, go ahead, and Daryl, we're throwing a lot of numbers at them. Yeah, I know. It really, and 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 what I believed when we st first started talking about making this presentation, maybe four or five people out of 100 that follow our work are going to be interested in this. But my belief is those people are going to want to see these tables. And there are, as you look at these tables, like for example, the one you were just talking about, if you retired at age 55, the first year's distribution is about $34,000. Instead of retiring at age 65, when the first year's distribution is about 80,000. So when you dig into these tables and you've got the time to be thinking in terms of your own possible situation in the family, I think you'll get a lot more out of these tables just because you'll see these numbers. You'll see what it what it's going to mean to your grandchild or your child. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I feel a little bit for the for the people who are listening to the podcast and not either viewing the the video presentation or don't have the tables in front of them. It's it's going to be a little hard to follow. So I would I would heartily recommend that you actually get the tables, and look at them, download them from the site, and look at them, yeah. and uh, and and or watch the the video presentation. It'll be a lot a lot clearer. I hope. Um, I hope. <laughs> it's if you if you're a numbers geek and you look at the numbers and you you think about how all this works. There are some very interesting observations that come out of it, and and, and can I hope can help you uh, decide how to try to to set up a fund like this for your grandchild. So, moving on, these these sets of tables we just went through here were all assumed a baseline return of ten percent of twelve percent. What happens if you only get ten percent every year, year in? year out. So if we look at that, if you remember the real amount for the total benefit was 10 a 10, little over $10 million, it's now $1.9 million. And the only thing that's different is that you got the 10%. We talked about that when we actually looked at the spreadsheet. So I'm not going to go through all these tables, but all the same tables are, are replicated here for a baseline annual return of 10% as opposed to 12%. And so you can see how that affects the scenario, your particular scenario that you may be interested in looking at. Um, that's, that I think is, is gonna be helpful. Um, you also, if, suppose you only choose to get 8% or you only end up getting 8%. Well, then your total benefit is about a little less than $400,000. Everything else is the same. This is the power of 95 years of compounding. Uh, um, it's it's impressive. Okay, uh, the same tables again. Go on and on. Uh, can I can I just can I add uh, something here that uh, may be confusing to people? Yeah, when it comes to uh, an investment that like a 401k where you're putting new money in every month, then the series, the sequence of events of the returns, the sequence of returns right. are going to drive your final result. But remember right. that 
what this investment is really doing, it's one investment, whether it's 10,000 or 5,000 or 1,000, it's one investment, one time. And we're investing it in a way, for example, in the case of our granddaughter, what we have recommended to uh, her mother is that it be 50% S&P 500 and 50% small cap value. Whether it's in the taxable account or it's the tax-free account, the Roth. Yeah, we're about to talk about that, Paul. And it's all the same money. This is right. not new money coming in. So when we talk about a compound rate of return of 12%, it doesn't mean it needs to be 12% every year. Because when you have a lump sum investment, it doesn't matter when the good times and the bad times are. So I... I well, so the only thing I would say about that is, is it, it does matter in retirement because their sequence of returns does matter because there you're taking money out every year. Okay. So, it, so it's not, it's like a negative contribution, right? And so it does matter whether the the, re, the market or your account balance yes, you, is up yeah, or down. Yes, you're absolutely right. So yes, up until retirement and, and yep. you start taking distributions, all that really matters is what the aggregate compound annual rate of return has been to that date. Yep. Um, after that, sequence of returns can bite you. You're right. Or, you're right. I or, stand corrected. Or help you. So we talked, as Paul mentioned, he talked about the rates of return, the, the 12% and the uh, 10% and the 8%. And so, and those were constant all the time. And we talked about why that may or may not be true all the time. Um, but this is also a fairly simplified uh, simulation. So how do you get 12%? How do you get 10%? How do you get 8%? So there are some ways you can do that. And so this is these are some options that we've put together uh, for how you can do that, um, or how you might be able to do that. Uh, if you're targeting the 12% rate of return, and you use, uh, and again, for these scenarios, the, the asset allocation never changed, okay? It was, because the rate of return changed. And what we've done is, is put together a portfolio that gets about 12%, and that's 50-50, the S&P 500 and the U.S. small cap value asset classes. And the historical return for that allocation for that portfolio would have been 11.9% from 1927 to 1920 to 2022. Uh, over the last 52 or three years or so, it's been about 13%. Um, if you decide that you don't like the risk profile of, of that type of an account in terms of standard deviation or other, other risk parameters, you could target a 10% account. That would be just strictly the S&P 500 index. And uh, from 1927 to 2022, that got you 10% a year. Uh, from 1970 to 2022, it got you 10.5% a year. So that's about a 10% account. 8%, this is where you can start putting some bonds in. Uh, and a 60-40 S&P 500 uh, five-year treasury note account for the bond side of things would have gotten you about 8.3% from 1927 and about 9% from 1970 to now. So those are some options for how you can, can modulate your return rate, how you can choose to, to target a return rate. Call it a target return rate because you can, nobody knows what it's going to be in the future. These are historical returns. But if you want to target a higher rate or a medium rate or a lower rate, these are some options for how you can do that. Um, as we mentioned, these are constant rates of return. doesn't matter before retirement. But it does afterwards. So this is these are not necessarily real results uh, that you saw. The sensitivity studies are meant to show you how your decisions can change the big things at the end, what the retirement withdrawals are, what the total benefit is, which includes how much you have left to give to others after you after you pass on at the end of the plan. Um, an example of how of funds you might choose to implement the asset allocation shown here, shown on the bottom of the slide, and then 
these are drawn from Chris Pedersen's uh, best in class recommendations, and you can find those on the site um, if, you, if you choose to want to implement a plan like this and target some of those target rates. I think that that's about all I have for now. Daryl, I know we have- That's a lot of numbers. We have people out there, they've got a question. They're not mm -hmm. sure whether that, is that number through uh, 2022, through October of 2022 or November of 2022? Um, you know, to be honest, it, I don't know that it matters. I think it's through the end of I think it's through the end of October, but okay, you know, it's over fifty years or over ninety two yeah, years. No, I don't no. think one or two months is going to change anything. I just wanted to answer it now rather than later. Yeah. <laughs> so, I think that's the other thing to remember is you know, it, it, to a certain extent, even quoting returns to a decimal point here yeah. is a yeah. little bit, almost a little bit disingenuous. Okay. Um, because those are the historical returns, that's true. But but to think that that gives you an idea to that level of precision, which you might get in the future, I, th I think you're you're reaching there. So <laughs> there, this is not that precise. Chris, what what would be your comments now about? Yeah, generally the 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 uh, uh, well, the questions you know are are being asked out there and. And, and what thoughts you have about the strategy? Well, my my first thought about the strategy is that I, I love the idea of setting something up that shows your child of their cared for, you know, that, that grandpa wanted to help uh, provide for them and help them be financially secure. And I think the, the letter that you're gonna write with Rich um, is a really, really important part of that. I love that uh, this gives your grandchild the chance to have a good, a meaningful uh, and representative learning experience about investing. Uh, one of the biggest risks with learning about investing is that you learn the wrong lesson. You invest for a short period of time, you have bad luck, and you decide that that tells you about the future. You know, there's a lot of people who invest in the stock market for a short period of time, lose some money, see it go down, and then decide to never, never be in the stock market again for the rest of their lives. And they've essentially learned the wrong lesson by waiting a longer period of time, you're more likely to learn the right lesson. So your granddaughter, probably isn't going to really look at and remember this account until she's in her teens, maybe even, you know, late teens. And by then the odds are in her favor that she'll learn a good lesson. So I, I love that. There are some big decisions to be made. Uh, this obviously is a plan. It's a very long-term plan, but let's talk about the idea of this being an all equity portfolio for the entire life of this investment. Uh, this is not an investment that's meant to be the investment for this person's retirement. Uh, I, I think the granddaughter is going to have to do her own saving uh, in, in order to be prudent because she doesn't know what it's going to take to cover the cost of living when she's in retirement. But Chris, what would be your your sales pitch to the family that this should be all equities for the rest of a child's life? Or if you didn't want to make that sales pitch and what you really believed in was they should be all equities until they're 55 or 60. And then from then on, they should uh, go to 60, 40. Or is there what would your plan be? The reason we have people move into fixed income approaching retirement is to reduce the volatility of the amount they have saved for retirement. Um, it reduces the uncertainty that, uh, you, you know, in the account size of the account balance. For somebody who has 
significantly oversaved, dramatically oversaved, they may not need to do that. Uh, so, um, as the grandchild is getting older and they understand what the potential benefit from grandpa's contribution is and what the potential benefit from their 401k is, they'll have a feeling for that. I feel like they're just kind of on that, you know, adding the two things together. It's just about the right amount. I would expect them to want to do something uh, probably with a target date fund or a balanced portfolio in their 401k where they start to reduce the uncertainty that uh, that it's going to, you know, the, the drawdown effectively, the drawdown risk that they're in. Um, because then as they get closer to retirement, they can look at the sum of the two and be confident that they have enough money to retire, even though it might go down by 20 or 30 uh, percent. But if they've over saved and they've much as they need approaching retirement and they can tolerate a 50% drawdown and still have enough to retire, they could be 100% equities. So I, I think it, um, now that assumes that they can sleep at night with that, right? So yeah. that's the other piece. It's behavioral and it's also, um, you know, trying to make sure you don't end up with too little money at a key point in your life, right? Those those two things both matter. Um, so I, I, you know, they'll, they'll figure it out. I hope, I hope you're, you know, I, I hope you have enough years left, Paul, and I think you have enough years left to give your da granddaughter all the information she needs. <laughs> well, I, that would be nice if, it, if 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 I could stick around that long. What about you, Daryl? Well, I will say one thing about the asset allocation, and that's that the tool doesn't care about asset allocation. It cares about return. And so there are a number of ways, any number of ways you can get any any kind of return you want. Um, you could, we showed a way to get 12% with a 50-50 S&P small cap value. You could just as easily get 12% with a combination of small cap value and fixed income. I don't know what the ratio is, but you could look at that. I'm sure it's in one of the fine tuning tables we put together mm -hmm. somewhere. Um, and, and you can you can go through and, and look at that and you can you can figure out how to get your own rate of return with your own asset allocation. The chart that we looked at, the table or the slide that we looked at was just some an option, a couple of options that you could use to get the target rates of return. Um, there are any number of ways you can use the fine tuning tables, for example, to figure out how to get the return that you think you want. Um, so or think you need or want. Actually, this is a want. That's the other thing. Um, it depends a lot on what, why you set this up. Um, if you set this up to be primarily something for your grandchild to use in retirement, um, as Chris mentioned, this is supplemental. This is an oversaved amount. They didn't save this, so this represents an oversaving amount from their perspective, potentially. On the other hand, if you set this up, suppose your grandchild is a special needs child, let's say, and you set this up to provide either support to them sometime during their life prior to retirement or allowing them to maybe retire earlier if they need to, you need to look at retirement early years. And, and, and if they retire at 55, maybe you need to reach for 12% and try to do that with, and maybe you choose to do it with a small cap value fixed income to sort of smooth the ride a little bit. Like, this is like uh, as Chris mentioned, this is the Larry's Swedrose barbell portfolio. There are any number of ways you can try to get a return and, and modulate that return based on the purposes behind why you set this fund up. Because at the end of the day, this is really a pretty simple thing to do. It sounds complex. You got all these numbers. There's a blizzard of numbers out there. But really what it boils down to is putting money away early, transferring it to Roth as soon as you can, and don't touch it. Don't peek. Let it work. Um, that's that's the key thing because you've you know you've got 65 years of compounding before retirement, and you got 30 years after that. And that's that's the power of this whole whole concept. It's at, at root, it's really very simple. I really like what you said there, Daryl, about a special needs child, too, because uh, you can't anticipate which children are going to be special needs. Sometimes right. disabilities come up later in life. You don't always see them at the beginning. 
And uh, it's nice to think that grandpa's generosity is providing a safety net that might provide in that circumstance um, for somebody who doesn't have the ability to save their own retirement. Right. It's, it has a lot of potential, a lot of different applications, a lot of different, different ways to, to help your grandchild. I think it's a great concept, Paul. Well, thank you for doing all that work, Daryl. Thank you for your thoughtful comments, both of you guys. And uh, the letter will be out in an article uh, at about the same time as as this uh, a podcast comes out next Wednesday, I think it is. And uh, I look forward to having a link in the podcast to that uh, to that letter and. Uh, and we would love some feedback on, on this. Uh, I know what my dream is for uh, for our granddaughter. My wife feels the same way. Uh, I'm actually being very forceful, I guess, and recommending that they split the money between the S and P 500 and small cap value. That gives them large growth and and so a little bit of large value and small growth and actually very little small growth, small value. Uh, and and uh, I'm actually telling her that don't even rebalance. Just, just the time that you'll rebalance, you guys may criticize this, but when you start taking the money out of these two funds to go into the uh, Roth IRA, that at that point, the money that comes out can be a 50-50 to start all over again. And whether they do that until they're 40 or 60 or for the rest of their life, I'm not going to be around to find that out. But my sense is, and this is the story I'm going to tell my granddaughter when the time comes, there are literally, with the portfolio that she has, millions of people every day going to work to work for these companies. When you have the S&P 500 and then you have another 500 or 1,000 companies that are smaller companies, you got a lot of people working to make those companies money. At the same time as those millions of people are working hard to make those companies money and make themselves a living, there are another group of millions of people who are the shareholders in these companies who benefit from the success of these companies. So now we've got many millions of people who are participating in this process. And there she will be owning these companies along with the shareholders, along with the people who are going to work every day. And they are theoretically all legitimate companies. Yes, there will be a percentage of crooks in the, in the mix. But generally, these will be companies that will be trying to add value to the economy, to their company, and likely would be, as if you looked at it as one company, that would be one heck of a company to own for your entire life. That is the story I'm going to, and, and the only thing, well, the two things that could get in the way of it working. One is the behavior of our granddaughter. If she decides, because she'll be able to, when that money goes into the Roth IRA, she can take it out. Now, her mother is the one sitting on the bulk of the money. The granddaughter isn't. And so what I told my kids, and my son reminded me of this recently, he reminded me that I told him, as I put money into his iris, I told this to all my kids, if I find out you've taken that money out, that is the last money you get from me, unless you're at the age of retirement, period. And I asked my son, did you believe me? He said, yes. So... You know, there is a way that this can probably work, but but the bottom line is it's a legitimate thing to do to own that. I mean, it, it's kind of like people who get into real estate. There are people who own real estate to make biz money off of the real estate all of their life. 
That would be misery to me. I would not want any part of that. But I do understand there are people who do that. I am more comfortable having a major part of our portfolio in equities than I would ever be in taking responsibility for being in the real estate business. So, you know, they're going to find their way. Uh, but, but, but Chris, you're right. I'm hoping I'm around to, uh, to, to, to at least share some of my ideas, uh, with her as she is in her probably mid to late teens. So thank you guys. Thank you always so very much, uh, for, for uh, what you do. And, uh, gosh, I don't know if we're going to do a Q and a before the end of the, uh, end of the month. This is it for this month, huh? For us working together. What well, you you, it's kind of up to you and scheduling. If you want to do something else, we could probably do it. Oh, yeah. well, that's a good idea. We have, our, we have our normal our normal first Tuesday meeting next Tuesday. So, all right, all right, great. Well, we'll do one more piece before the end of the year. Thank you very much, and uh, and again, thanks for all you do, and thanks to our listeners for all you do. And boy, when you refer us. Uh, your friends to our work. Uh, maybe this is not the piece to make the very first piece that they <laughs> that they come to, but you know we we uh, we want to try to help all levels of investors, from those who want a little to those who want a lot. So uh, all the best to all of you, and thank you for watching. Is there anything that could make any of the three of us look better uh, other than being younger, of course. No. Yeah, that would help a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am excited about this. It's Paul Merriman with Sound Investing. Sound Investing, soundinvesting.com and paulmerriman.com are produced and exclusively owned by Paul Merriman, who is solely responsible for their content. For more information, free articles, mutual fund recommendations, and more, visit paulmerriman.com.